welcome back to Scar Bearers. I'm Chris D.T. Gordon, as always. It is a blessing to have you here with me today and with me in a technological sense are Nate and Britton Barron. If you want them to work their magic on your creative projects, you can check them out at Nate Barron. So folks, as always, I love that you visit my website, linktr.ee forward slash Chris DT Gordon. I have been working hard to share my message with others about the attitude of gratitude and passing on perfection and going for greatness. And if you can help me out by stopping by and, and downloading my tag one sheet, maybe take a look at my speaking websites. Maybe you know someone that would benefit from my message and I can talk with them. Or maybe you want a t-shirt from my Chris DT Gordon's tag and pop shop. You can find some inspiration you can wear on your person. And speaking of persons, I am joined by a lovely one. We have Kathleen Sibilski from neighboring Wisconsin. Kathleen, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here with me today. And Kathleen and I have a number of things in common. First of all, we're both Midwesterners. She lives in Wisconsin and I live in Minnesota. Secondly, we are both NF survivors. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I was delighted to hear there were both veterans of public television. We both worked in a public television studio in our college years. Now, Kathleen, what did you do when you were working in public television? I did a little bit of everything. I did uh, the floor manager thing where you count down and do the finger to get pe people to go mm -hmm. and, and do their stuff. I was, um, I operated cameras. I was in the thing that I forget what it's called now, where you, you're up in the booth and you switch from one camera to the other. Was that a switcher? Yeah. Yep, the so, camera, yeah, the camera switcher will call it that, or the yeah, uh, yeah, some, yeah. sometimes yeah. it's uh, you know, like the uh, assistant producer or assistant right. uh, director. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So I did that, and I mean, I did a little bit of everything. We had to do the TV auction. Did you ever have to do that? Oh yes, the, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the the uh, the um, was it the the felt uh, the fundraising drive? Yes, exactly. So that was uh, you know. 14, 15 hour days. So it was fun. It really was. Yeah. I, I, I have fond memories of dressing up as Elmo and, <laughs> being, and being on camera before I was more comfortable with it and feeling my mind just shutting down. <laughs> I was a 6'1", is how tall I am. I was an elf, believe it or not, on the Santa. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> so that was fun. Oh, and I see we're also, I glimpsed uh, on your wall there, we're both geeks. You got the Dark Knight behind oh, you, know you and I, I have you know, uh, the Ninja Turtles and Deadpool behind me. <laughs> yes, excellent. Excellent. So yeah. We do have a lot in common, uh, but going back to the uh, necrotizing fasciitis, you know, I can tell that you were a very artistic person that probably stemmed before your about of nf why don't you take me on a little trip uh, a little background trip to tell me you know what happened you know what what life was like before nf and then we'll go we'll get into it okay yeah you know i was 48 at the time and um my son had started college and my daughter was in high school and um i was you know just uh, very healthy i had been like really working out and stuff so I was like the best shape of my life and um you know my husband and I were just going through life and um but from time to time I would have gallbladder attacks mm. and um you know a couple different times I had to go to the ER and they would kind of you know give me some painkillers and send me on my way so did they ever, they, I'm sorry did, did they ever figure out like what was causing them or was it just some kind of something uh hereditary or genetic no well well i mean it was they would do they did uh an ultrasound and they didn't find any gallstones so that that was what they were concerned about but i had a brother who had the same sort of symptoms and they finally found mm -hmm. out that his gallbladder just wasn't functioning properly okay 
So it could be a genetic thing. So I um, finally, finally, they did a, a test after I'd had a bad, bad gallbladder attack. They did a test that were to check for function. And during that function, I remember I felt like a little like kind of pop there. And I don't know if maybe that has something to do with what happened or I, I don't know, but um, they determined my gallbladder wasn't functioning at all. And they, they said, you know, we'll, um, we'll do this, uh, we'll remove it. We, it has to come out, but and they had like a month in advance. They had, they had scheduled my surgery. Then a couple of days later, I had a attack so bad that I had to like pull over to the side of the road. I was driving and, and mm. it was just terrible. And I went into the ER and, you know, all they did was give me painkillers and they said they moved up my surgery for a couple of weeks. So then I, I went in, it was May 17th, 2012 for my um, surgery. And, you know, I've had surgery before and outpatient stuff and I you know figured I'd get this done they they it was on a Tuesday they said you know or it was on a Thursday they said by Tuesday I'd be back at work he really kind of downplayed it the surgeon and he just said you know it's it's not a big deal it's you know you're you're going to be fine mm -hmm. so I went in there expecting to kind of you know mm -hmm. uh come home sleep it off and be fine um and then I went in for the surgery. My sister came with me. My husband had a job interview that day. And, and she said it was incredibly fast. Like, you know, I was in there maybe a half an hour. And um, when I woke up, I was in so much pain. And I, and I told the, the nurses and they said, you know, oh, honey, you know, they fill you full of air and that air is escaping and that's what's causing your pain. And I, you know, I'm not like a real believer in psychic phenomenon or whatever, but when I woke up, I knew somewhere deep in my soul that my life was never going to be the same. And I, I knew that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I went home and instead of falling asleep and sleeping it off, I was pacing around, doubled over at the waist in so much pain. And I went back to the ER. And they said, oh, honey, that's the air escaping from the surgery and you'll be fine. And they gave me a big old shot of Dilaudid and they sent me home. And I paced around and crying and just in agony. And then um, in the middle of the night, I decided I had to go back to the air. So I went back and, you know, finally my family said, we're not leaving until you figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So they said, we think a clip might have fallen off. So you maybe have pancreatitis. I, you know, they, they were very vague about the whole thing. And they sent me to a different hospital in Illinois and uh, by ambulance. And they said, okay, well, we're gonna send you to a different hospital in, in Janesville, Wisconsin. And they're gonna go in and they're gonna fix that little clip and you're gonna be 100%. So at this time, when you're heading to Janesville, that's your third hospital. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I go to Janesville and they, um, it was a lot of waiting around and I'm in so much pain and I, I couldn't eat anything or drink anything. So they had these little sponge things for me to suck on and it was just a nightmare. And then, um, finally that I'm still waiting for them to do this procedure. You know, I, I haven't seen any doctor for a full day. Then they, um, they finally, they did the procedure and I woke up and I felt absolutely no better. And they said, you know, just, just give it a, a little bit. You're going to feel great. It's going to be just fine. And then my, my vital signs crashed Ooh. and yeah. And they, I passed out apparently and they, they put me in ICU. They thought that I had heart, had maybe a heart attack. Um, so, but I hadn't. And then they they said, okay, well, we're gonna go in tomorrow morning. We're gonna see what's going on here. And they went in and, you know, my family said that, you know, and I had a brother who worked for hospice. He said that when they went in the room, they had never, he had never seen a 
human being on more machines. I mean, I was on every kind of life support and a, you know, ventilator and everything else. And it was, um, they, the doctors told my family that I had, I had an infection and, you know, they're going to go in there a couple times and they're going to clean stuff up, but it's, you know, it's, you know, my, and they were, of course, is she going to be okay? And my husband was like, All right, is she going to be okay? Oh yeah. Yeah. She's going to be fine. She'll be fine. So they ended up going back in there. Um, I think 11 times. Um, I'm sorry. You said 11 times. 11 times Ooh. to do, yep. To, and, you know, it was, it's, you know, what I had was retroperitoneal necrotizing fasciitis. So mm. it was on the back wall of the inside of my body. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, so they, they had to basically, you know, not to be gross, but they had to like kind of remove all my intestines, put them on a table, go in there do all the debridements or debridements or whatever, however you pronounce that. And then, you know, put everything back in. And then I was kept open between them. So I just had a piece of plastic over my belly. Yeah. Um, I'm imagining the, uh, like an R-rated version of the operation game. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, take things <laughs> out. Exactly Don't correct. touch the sides. <laughs> right. right. So um, then, you know, finally I, I got through all of those and I was, you know, not doing great, but I was, I was kind of in the clear a bit. And I was finally moved out of ICU. And I noticed that like doctors and nurses and stuff would come to the door of my room, kind of look in, look at me and then walk away. And then finally, this one guy, my family said, you know, can, can we help you? He said, yeah, I just wanted to, to, get a look at the girl who survived necrotizing fasciitis. <laughs> and, they said, and they said, what? What? Did, yeah, flesh eating bacteria. She has nec necrotizing fasciitis. That's what we were. And we had no idea. So they immediately called down and got my records. And sure enough, but my family had not been told at all. Wow. Now, and, you know, it sounds like the way you're describing it, Kathleen, that the doctors didn't know exactly what it was until they were operating. Am, am I yeah, correct yeah, in that? Because I think if they if they had, I think they would have moved with a little more urgency. Yeah, of course. And they, yeah, yeah they did know. And I and I, I understand that it can be hard to diagnose. You know, I hear that from a, a lot of people, but you know, then when they went in there, they did know and they didn't let my family know. And um and that was kind of a hard one to swallow, you know. Yeah. Um but uh, I had, um, six drains coming out of my belly. So these mm. six plastic things with, I had to like carry them in a purse, which was interesting. And then I was in the hospital for two months. I ended up being in there. Um, I was, um, I, and I ended up getting, uh, a blood clot in my lung. I got pneumonia. I got bed sores. Um, so it was just kind of one thing after another and, but, you know, finally, oh, I, well, initially they, like, as soon as I was out of those, you know, those first operations, they were kind of making plans to get me out of there. So I was sent home and, um, for a week, and then I had to go back to get kind of a checkup and, and they said, um, they called when I got home and they said, you know, her sodium level is a little off. So give her some Gatorade to my sister. And, um, you know, we later found out that my sodium was so bad that I was in danger of getting, uh, of getting brain damage. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, and then my sister said, well, how is her white count? And, um, and the nurse kind of shuffled papers and, and said, could you hold on a second? She came back and said, get her back here right now. So I was back in the hospital for more antibiotics. And so then that was in a, the second month that I was there. Wow. So you so you said second month. Yeah. So it was two months altogether in the hospital. Okay. And then I, sounds familiar. 
Yeah, I bet. I bet. And, you know, then I went back a couple times because I got abscesses and so forth. But, um, you know, I, I lost um, like 35 pounds. Mm. Um, so I looked like, you know, those people that you see in concentration camps. Um, I had these drains coming out of my belly. I was too weak to walk at first at all. Um, so I had to like, when I got home, I had to kind of like crawl up the stairs with help because I couldn't get upstairs. Um, it just was, you know, and, and of course, um, this is something that a lot of people deal with, you know, for those two months, I was on an almost constant morphine drip. So you get out and you're dependent on painkillers, you know, and that's part of the deal. And so I, you know, had to, I immediately started weaning myself off of them. And that was a whole journey, you know, um, but, you know, the, the main thing, my main, you know, message is, you know, it's so important to have family around advocating for you. Yes. And yes, indeed. Family or friends, because, you know, I have a very smart, you know, family and they were very aggressive about making sure that I was getting correct care. And I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for my husband and my sister and my brothers and my kids. And, you know, they they made sure that I was alive, you know. And um so yeah, so then I, I was home and um, we at the time like couldn't afford the copay for physical therapy. So, you know, my husband kind of, I had a walker, my husband would kind of walk me down the driveway and back up and then I would be able to go a little further. And then finally I had a cane. And um, so I was, um, I, uh, it was, this was during the summer and then in September, you know, I was supposed to start back at school, supposed to start my job. And I just insanely thought, like, I think that in my head, I thought I'm going to get back there and my life is going to be like it was last spring. You know, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. So I started back at my job and it was, and I had still had a couple drains and, and it was the difficulty of this was beyond what I can even tell you. I mean, I was just, you know, praying all day in my head. And um, it was just like, every day was, was so hard. And, you know, I'm a special education age. So yes, there were days is, where- Even healthy, that is a tough day, yes, day in and so, day out. Right. So, you know, there were days where I would have to be kind of sitting with kids who were screaming and hitting me and stuff all day. And it, I mean, it was, it was just very, very difficult. I worked at a, um, at a grade school at the time I work high school now, but um, so it was, you know, a full year before I felt even marginally normal, even, you know, like a semi-functioning person because I, I you know I would get home from work and I would just lay down and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and then you know I slept a lot <laughs> yes <laughs> so, yes well, that, that rest yeah. is so important it and is so, if you don't want me asking Kathleen I know you know our stories are similar in some aspects and different in other ways obviously but what was it for you that kept you waking up and getting back to work because it could have been very easy to say you know what I got to stay home I have to I got to rest get a sub or hire someone else what kept you going to school every day well I mean I think that I you know I kind of developed this attitude real early where it's like I'm not going to even take this day by day that's way too long I'm going to take this every five minute increment that comes up and I'm going to get through that five minutes and then I'm going to get through the next one. And so I would just get up every day and, you know, just take 
each little bit as it came. And I, you know, I think in the back of my mind was wanting to be kind of a good role model for my children. Mm-hmm. I think that that was like the main motivator because I, you know, I want, I wanted to get better for them and I wanted to, you know, show them that I was, I was strong and I wanted to, you know, I, I guess, and I, you know, there's part of it, I, you know, there's a lot of, I had a lot of anger towards a lot of the medical professionals because, you know, I feel like my case was bungled to a degree. And, you know, I guess I kind of maybe wanted to show everybody, you know, I, I can do this. I can, I can get through. And, um, and I did. And yeah, yes, I you did. And then you still are. Uh, but I want to yeah. go back quickly uh, and touch on that, what you said regarding taking every moment, because I, I, because I think people who go through something like we do, it's, you know, it's not like, oh, this day was good. This day was bad. It's every day. There are innumerable battles you have to fight, you know, physically, mentally emotionally and i think by taking it as you said five minutes at a time that is you know sometimes the best way to take it because you know i'm a runner i'm not sure i I heard you work out i'm not sure if you're a runner no Uh, i'm not (laughs) but as a long distance runner you train yourself at least i do of not looking at the entire race in one in one sitting because you'll it's too daunting but if you look at it every mile or every block or every turn, it becomes more manageable. Because yeah, yeah I could take a hundred more, you know, I could take another step, I could take that next block, oh, I could take that next mile. By breaking it up like that, it not only makes things a lot more manageable, you know, in terms of your mental uh, state, but also emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Because it is, it is a hard go. And, uh, you know, we NF survivors have our own individual stories, but we have this underlying commonality that it's a son of a gun and you got to find a way through it. And, you know, not, you know, taking it little by little is sometimes the absolute best way of doing that. Right. Um, And, um, you know, a couple of other things that sort of helped me through is, you know, you have to, you have to have a positive attitude, of course. And, you know, I kind of found out that, you know, I've kind of always thought of myself as kind of a cynical gal. Um, But, you know, you kind of find out that, you know, I'm more positive than I thought I was, because you have to be to get through something like this. Yes. And, um, but on the flip side of that, you know, there's a bit of, of anger, like, wait a minute, this I'm not going to let this, you know, end my life. I am not going to, and and there's a, you know, I was pissed. (laughs) I didn't want to, you know, I was just angry that this happened to me. And and that was kind of a motivator as well. I was able to, you know, that kind of made me get up and made me do stuff because I was like, you know, yeah, this, I'm I'm not going to let this, I I was, I was just too angry about it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I love that because that's actually a, a different take on what uh, on my story. Because when I made a switch to, uh, you know, to to develop what I call the attitude of gratitude, I was on that precipice. Of, okay, how am I going to view this? Am I going to be the why me guy, or am I going to look at things with more gratitude. And I like how you turn that a little bit in terms yeah. of saying, instead of saying, why, you know, why me and being sad, you took it as like someone punching you in the mouth. But like, right. you know, you didn't run away. Oh, that hurt so bad. You're like, oh, you, is that, is that all you got? Yeah, exactly. Let's go, you know, yeah. d- double pump. Let's go, you know? And so I <laughs> love that attitude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I am upset, but that doesn't mean I'm shying away. I, right. you know that and I love and I love that that mindset but I think also what you said about positivity positivity isn't shiny and rainbows right it's right. I'm going to make it and if, if that has an angry tone to it if that works for you that's beautiful yeah. because yeah. 
it, you know, every person is different and whatever works for you work it. Right. I mean, you know, it's just, it's in my optimism and positivity during this was, it's just way deep down inside because I'm, you know, I'm sarcastic. I'm kind of have a world weary attitude and, you know, people find my sarcasm and stuff funny. And, you know, it's just, I, I don't give off a real kind of perky attitude, you know, and I never did. Well, you're Midwestern. Um, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's down in there. It's way deep down in there, this, you know, kind of fortitude and you like each second is, was like that first year, each second was like, am, am I going to give into this or am I going to not give into this? And you just have to keep choosing that I'm not going to. And, and that's, you know, that just gets you through little by little. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so another thing that got me through, I just wanted to mention was um, my, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a freelance artist. Um, and I have a big brother who's my oldest of my three brothers, who's also an artist. And he, early on the first year, he said, you know what, let's, we should try to get, have a show together, our paintings, we should show. To, and, you know, I don't think I was ready for that, but I think he, he knew that was a, a really wise thing to do because that had gave me this something to work towards. Mm -hmm. And, and then I was able to make these paintings and express my feelings and um, that I was going through. And it just gave me this kind of concrete goal to work towards. And I think that was really, really helpful. Did you find that when you were doing your art, you weren't focused so much on your internal struggles? Exactly, exactly. It just gave me this external assignment sort of to do. And that was incredibly helpful. It was yeah. just, uh, just gave me something to kind of focus on outside of, you know, God, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I love what you said about, I, I wasn't ready because- yeah we're never ever going to be a hundred percent ready for anything. We might think we were ready enough, but there, you know, there's always that little bit of uncertainty, but the right. fact that you were able to say, Oh, I'm not ready, but I'm still going to do it. I think that's <laughs> so important for people to hear because there are lots of talented people out in the world who are waiting for ready. And they'll always be waiting because they they just have that that fear is overriding that impulse to uh, to act and so I love that you said you know what I'm not ready but I'm still gonna do it yeah yeah it, that's important to do it really is and you know I don't think anybody would ever do anything if they waited until they're ready <laughs> exactly so what are you doing now Kathleen I am working my job I'm on spring break thank god and um but I'm, I'm working a lot. I'm, I do my full eight hour day at, as a special education aide. Then I do um, two hours. I, I teach art classes for at the elementary school. And then I have a little Etsy shop where I sell my paintings, which has been getting more and more and more and more successful, which I'm great thrilled to know, but it's, it's, I think I may, might be nearing the point where a decision might have to be made about, you know, maybe just doing that. So, um, so I'm working, you know, a lot and I like to work a lot. I, you know, it's, I, I like to keep myself busy and, um, and I'm just uh, living my life and, and being happy to be alive, you know, yes. every day, every day. I also, I take a lot of pictures. I, I do a lot of photography and, you know, part of that is just since this happened, the, just the beauty around me has become much more apparent and mm -hmm. just the, the beauty of a, you know, a shadow of a tree on the side of a house or, you know, uh, just the, the blue sky or whatever in the changing seasons. And, I just feel really compelled to kind of capture that because I'm, I am, you know, noticing that way more than I ever did before. And that's, you know, that's a positive side of what happened to me for sure. Yes, definitely. And I, and I love that you're making 
those observations. And I find that as well uh, with me that I have noticed, I mean, not, not that I was always a cynical uh, negative person before NF, but in the last six years, I have found more appreciation for everyday things. Like for example, this tape, you know, this uh, roll of tape, you know, we all have this roll of tape in our house, but when you really need it and you can't find it, it's the most important item in your possession, you know, when you yeah. eventually find it again. And so finding the value of everyday things, mm -hmm. I think is immeasurably important because when we do that, we find that we are richer than we ever thought possible. Yep. And you yep. know, by finding the value, like you said, in a in the shadow of a tree on a house is maybe something you, you know, that no one else will have but you, but you have it and you have value for that. Right. And I'm here to see it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So if Kathleen, if someone wanted to get in touch with you for either inspiration or to see some of your wonderful paintings and uh, artwork, where could they find you? Well, I am, um, like I said, I have an Etsy shop. It's the name of the shop is Saint Icon. It's all one one word. I do um, icons of saints and nice. which is, you know, I was raised Catholic, not so much anymore, but they it's they're very um, inspiring people. Um, a lot of them were through incredible trials themselves. So I, I it's just uh, very interesting to me. And um, so, yeah, that's it's all one word that's on Etsy and you can see that there. And I'm also on Instagram, my my photos. And that is um, it's Kathy Faf, Ta wait, Kathy Faf, Kathy, something like that. I can't remember right now. Well, you, yeah. you send it to me. I'll put it in the uh, link description Perfect. and in the, okay. in the description uh, details. Okay. Yeah. So I'm on there. And, um, and then I just wanted to mention one more thing that was incredibly helpful to my, um, my getting better. And that's that two years ago, for the first time in my entire life, I got a doggy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that pet is it's just I can't tell you how much this has helped me and I just something that I wanted to recommend that if if you're going through an incredibly rough time having this little warm furry being who loves you unconditionally um is just uh it's magical and yes. I, I really recommend it so well I, I was going to ask if there's one thing you wanted to uh, impart on the uh on a, on a viewer uh, before we left. I think that's great. You know, and it doesn't have yeah. to be a dog, but you know, definitely dogs have that unconditional love for us. They do. They do. And that's, that's helpful. And just like I said, um, lean on your family, lean on your friends and um, lean on the people who are there for you and love you and, um, and, and reach out to other people. I, you know, immediately found a, a support group online and, and that helps. And I've made some amazing online lifelong friends um, from those groups. And just talking to someone who's been through the same thing is invaluable. Yeah, it, ma it makes you feel less alone. Yes. Yep. So I have one more question, Kathleen. And uh, it's, a, it's a question my audience always loves to, loves to learn the answer to. What is your favorite dinosaur? Because I know you have a great story for this. Okay. Um, one time, like years ago, my husband and I were in an antique store and we found it was like a foot and a half long, like cast bronze triceratops, totally realistic looking triceratops. And it was so beautiful. It was $60, which was a lot of money for us at the time. So we said, oh, I don't know. And then we, we got home and I, I said, you know what? We got to have that Triceratops. It's the, that is the thing that this home needs. So we went back there and it was gone. And I've spent years looking online for a similar object. No dice. Biggest regret of my life. If you see the Triceratops, get the Triceratops. That's, that's my lesson in life. 
I, 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 I told you before the record, recording started, that is the title of your next book. <laughs> and I, yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> the triceratops. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an honor and a privilege to talk with you and learn your story. It's so nice to meet you. Same here. Okay, so folks, you. so folks, if you want to reach out to Kathleen, just look in the link description for her information. If you want to find out what I'm up to, you can go to linktr.ee forward slash Chris DT Gordon. I have my speaking websites. If you want to reach out to me about sharing my message with your group, your students, whomever, if you want to get a nice t-shirt uh, that says tag on like I have right here, those who are listening to the podcast are missing out, but it's my wonderful tag emblem. You can get that at the Chris DT Gordon tag and pop shop. If you want a free tag one sheet to remind yourself how to pass some perfection and go for greatness and live that attitude of gratitude. You can find that at the Linktree site. So many other things. Uh, please like and subscribe my podcast and YouTube channels and just share messages of hope and inspiration wherever you can. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining me. Please have a great day and remember to pass on perfection and go for greatness. <laughs>